We welcome you to another Sunday School lesson. Sunday School is a gift from God. The inscription on this psalm of praise is attributed to King David. David wrote this psalm toward the end of his life. Each psalm emphasizes the praise of the Lord for different reasons. As we study Psalm 103, we discover that there is no petition or plea for anything, only praise. We are reminded that God's blessings to Israel are dependent on their obedience to God's covenant. Believers today, although under grace, likewise should understand that to enjoy God's best, requires obedience to His will. It appears that the psalmist is talking to himself as he reflects on the goodness of the Lord to him and to Israel. Overwhelmed with the Lord's benevolence, he bursts into praise and worship. David begins the psalm with personal praise, moves to national praise, and concludes with a call to public or universal praise. Verse 1 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. David begins the psalm by talking with himself to bless the Lord. To praise or bless is to speak good of something or somebody. When applied to God, Bless means praise as an expression of our gratitude, worship, and adoration for who he is and for what he has done or does. When it is applied to humans, it means a prayer that they be blessed or happy. The phrase God bless you is a common greeting among Christians. In churches, we often conclude services by giving a blessing to the congregation. The word soul refers to the total person, life, or mind. The psalmist summons the entire makeup of his person to bless God. This means heart, soul, mind, and all his faculties and intellect, are to be focused on praising the Lord. Praise must come from our whole being. Verse 2 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. David repeats the call for his soul to bless the Lord, emphasizing its importance, and adds forget not his benefits. In other words, remember all the good things God has done. As humans, we often tend to focus more on our problems and needs instead of on what God has done in our lives. Moses knew how prone people are to forgetting their blessings, so he reminded Israel to endeavor to remember and never forget all that the Lord did for them. David reminds us, too. Verse 3 says, Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. David now lists six benefits he received from the Lord, forgiveness, healing, redemption, love and mercies, satisfaction, and renewal. The verbs used here to describe these blessings are in the present tense, they are continuous actions that never stop. God's blessings and dealings with his people are a continuous process. They portray God's mercy and love to his people. Of chief importance to David is that the Lord forgives all, since there is no limit to God's mercy, and there is no type or degree of sin God cannot forgive. The second blessing mentioned here is God's power to heal. Some believe that this phrase is a parallelism to the previous clause, that is forgiving iniquities is like healing diseases. Sin is often regarded as a disease of the soul or spiritual sickness. Although this is true, it is equally probable that David is referring to healing of physical ailment. No matter how healing is affected, through a doctor, medication, prayer, or miracle, all healing is of God. Verse 4 says, Who redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with love and compassion. The next blessing in David's list is redemption. This is like God rescuing someone from the pit of death or grave. Here David recalls several times God delivered him from the hands of his enemies, from King Saul and from his own son Absalom. This is also a reminder to the children of Israel of the Lord's act of deliverance from their bondage in Egypt. Included in this catalogue of blessings is God's loving kindness and tender mercies for humanity, described here as a crown. A crown symbolizes a bestowing of honor. Here David experiences God's love and compassion as an honor. The word for crown, Hebrew atar, in other contexts means to surround. The picture comes to mind of God surrounding us, honoring us, and beautifying us with his abundant loving kindness and mercies. Verse 5 says, Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
Another reason David's soul ought to bless the Lord is because the Lord satisfies his desires with good things, so that his youth is renewed like the eagles. Here David refers to physical or tangible things. When one has enough, the degree of stress is reduced. Nothing weakens the body and ages one more than poverty and stress. As king, David was usually not short of worldly goods. The final clause refers to the Lord's act of strengthening and maintaining believers' youthfulness even in old age so they are able to soar like the eagle. Verse 6 says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. After reflecting on his personal blessings and his praise to the Lord, David turns to communal or national praise. He recalls God's blessings and merciful dealings with his people, Israel. As a righteous and just God, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment or justice for the oppressed. He sees that the oppressed receive fair judgment from their oppressors. Israel was delivered from slavery in Egypt and experienced justice on several occasions on battlefields as the Lord rescued them from the hands of their oppressors. Verse 7 says, He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. David recalls God's dealings with Israel. He manifested himself to his people by his acts and his ways. He spoke to Moses directly and revealed his plans and the reasons for his actions. As the Lord used Moses to rescue Israel from its oppressors, he uses Christ to liberate those who believe in him from the bondage of sin and Satan. Christ shall finally deliver us on his return. Verse 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Verses 8-11 to capture the essence of God's character of grace, mercy, and unfailing love toward humanity, the crown of his creation. The Hebrew for the word merciful is rakhum, which means compassionate. The Hebrew translation for gracious is kanun, which comes from a root that means to bend or stoop in kindness to an inferior, to favor. The Lord is full of all these traits. Verse 9 says, He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He is patient with his people, he restrains his anger. He does not always rebuke or chastise us, his anger comes, but slowly and after much mercy has been shown. Verse 10 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. He does not pay us back according to our sins. If he did, there would be no hope for sinful humanity. David knew that his sins, and the sins of his people, deserved much greater judgment or discipline than received. Verse 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. The psalmist presents us with a glimpse of the greatness of God's mercy. He compares it with the height of the heavens. Just as the distance between the heavens and the earth is great beyond our thoughts, so great and limitless is God's mercy toward his people those who fear, love or reverence, him. In spite of how sinful we are, God's forgiveness and mercy toward those who love him is limitless and eternal. Verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God's mercy is demonstrated in his forgiveness of our sins. In this psalm, David uses a directional metaphor to describe the extent of God's forgiveness the distance between east and west. They are opposites, the implication is that our sin is the complete opposite of our place in God. That's how far our sins have been removed. There is no end to his forgiveness, it never ends. Verse 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Using a parental metaphor, David demonstrates God's love, grace, and compassion for his people, playing on the affection a father has for his child. In the Bible, God is often compared with a father or a parent, a portrait that excellently depicts the concept of God's character. Teaching his disciples to pray, Jesus refers to God as our Father, from Matthew 6 9, and again he compares how God cares for his people to the way a father cares for his son. A father is always ready to care for the child's needs and willing to forgive when the child does wrong or commits an offense. This is a perfect portrait of God's love and compassion for us, his children. 
The father's response to the prodigal son accurately depicts the Lord's fatherly response to those who repentantly come to him. No matter how sinful we are, God's grace never wears out, nothing we do can alter God's loving grace and mercy for those who fear him. This is the kind of God we worship and who should be praised. Verse 14 says, For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. The Lord shows us mercy because of our relationship with him and because of our weak and feeble makeup. David declares, For he knoweth our frame, the word frame is the Hebrew yetshr, from its verb yetsar, which means to shape or work into a form, and is used several times in pottery analogies. God is often portrayed as the potter and humanity as the clay. As our creator, the Lord knows us well, he knows what we are made of because he made us. As our designer, the Lord remembers and does not forget our framework. He created us out the dust. He knows how frail we are and how easily we can crumble and disintegrate. Verses 15 and 16 say, The life of mortals is like grass, they flourish like a flower of the field, the wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. The psalmist applies agrarian and horticultural motifs to describe the brevity of our lifespan and the temporal nature of humanity on earth. David compares us to the grass or the flower that quickly grows up and blossoms but easily fades and is blown away by the wind and is gone. Because God is aware of our makeup, our weak and feeble nature, and the shortness of our lives, he deals gently with us, and extends his love, mercy, and compassion to us. Verse 17 says, But from everlasting to everlasting the Lord's love is with those who fear him. David says that God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. That means that God's love, his mercy, and grace toward humanity, have their foundation in eternity even before the foundation of the earth and lasting beyond the end of the earth. God's mercy has no beginning and it has no ending. It has ever been and will ever be. These blessings, the psalmist says, are for those who fear him and for their posterity, from generation to generation. Verse 21 says, Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. David begins the psalm with a personal call to praise the Lord. He recounts the benefits he has received that make it imperative for him to bless the Lord. He then stirs up a national praise and urges the entire world, especially the nation of Israel, to praise. He instructs all created beings to join in the praise of the Lord. All the powerful and obedient angels who listen and obey the Lord, the heavenly armies, and all the ministers that serve the Lord and do his will should join in praising the Lord. That means all angels in all their ranks and duties should continue to praise the Lord. Verse 22 says, Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. The psalmist concludes with a call to all God's creation everywhere to praise and bless the Lord. No creation, animate or inanimate, is exempt from praising the Lord. Finally, David ends the psalm the way he started by calling on his soul to praise the Lord. As part of God's creation, the psalmist again reminds himself to join other creatures in singing praises in worship to the Lord. Key Verse As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us Psalm 103:12. This is a description of the great forgiveness of God. Given the true shape of the earth, east and west never meet and this is how far God has removed our sins from us. Thought to remember. Learn to speak the language of blessing and praise. Examine what it means to praise the Lord with our whole heart and mind and soul, appreciate his righteousness, compassion and grace, and Give thanks for his mercy and goodness in heartfelt worship. We need to heed David's call to show our love to God by praising and giving him thanks with all that is within us at all times and in all circumstances. Our lesson next week is entitled, Love God for the Gift of Jesus. Our biblical reference is Luke 1 31 Love God for the Gift of Jesus. We are truly glad you spent time to learn this week's lesson with us. We hope you are blessed and may share these with somebody else. We wish you can join us at the Kubau Church of Christ soon.
our congregation is a place to discover faith, find new friends, grow closer relationship with Christ and serve with each other's gifts. Thank you very much, have a great week, and God bless you always, dear brothers and sisters.